Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome to the second channel here on Smarter Every Day. This interview is amazing. Dr. Angela Alento, I walked into the NASA press site and I walk up and ask to see somebody that knows what they're talking about and I was ushered into a room to, to speak with Angela. She is an impressive lady and her resume is fantastic. She's the Dean of Physical Sciences at the University of Chicago and you should just go read her resume. It's amazing. Anyway. This was a fantastic interview because she laid out everything in uh, very simple details for me. She's also a colleague of Dr. Eugene Parker's, so it's fantastic. I hope you enjoy it. I'm Destin and Angela, Hi, you nice work to with you. Mr. Parker? So I'm um, the Physical Sciences Division Dean at the University of Chicago. So now I'm sort of responsible for all the physical sciences in Chicago. But my history in the 90s was a researcher, much junior than uh, Jean, who went to work in the astrophysics department where he was chair. So this is my background. So I've, I've known him since the early 90s as a younger researcher. And now I'm you know, a senior researcher and he is now happy to be watching a launch of the, the probe, the Parker Solar Probe that so was named like after him. His life's work, right? It's his life's work. Really and he is, um, he is somebody that um, would never have guessed that this could happen to him because he's incredibly humble and just loves physics. He loves astrophysics and loves to understand the universe by sitting down, writing equations, trying to understand how the physics in the cosmos works, the stuff we know on Earth, how does it get translated out there? And uh, he would do that from an early age. And then when he came to the University of Chicago, he was very puzzled by what was going on with, you know, for example, comet tails and other issues with um, the solar system as a whole and sat down and wrote the equations that we call hydrodynamic equations for what would look like uh, this plasma from the sun all the way to the edge of the solar system. And what he found was that there would be the solar wind and it would be a supersonic flow of these plasma particles, so the, the very hot you know, protons and electrons, so the same atoms that we have on Earth, but all very heated up, so they become this charged plasma. So that what was what he wrote down, and he had a very hard time publishing that paper because people didn't believe it. People thought, no way, there is no wind, supersonic speeds coming from the sun all the way to the Earth. There's nothing between the sun and the Earth. It's really, you know, just empty space, and there shouldn't be any problem flying out there, for example. Turns out he was right, <laughs> and those who were very what? skeptical about him. Um, what made him see it? Like, what made him think it was there? It was physics, you know. So people had, you know, physics has the equations that explain the universe, right? But then we need to make some assumptions. We don't sit down and outcome everything. It doesn't. You don't come out of the equations very easy, right? Or your camera. It right. takes a little time, and so you, it makes you make models, right? So people would make models, and they assume there was nothing. So if you assume there's nothing between the sun the earth then you know your solution will tell you zero <laughs> but if you look a little deeper and you say well wait a minute could there be something uh, he would uh, which is what he did and he found yes there is this whole solar wind and nobody believed him so he had a hard time publishing this is 1958 by 1962 he got a bit lucky compared to many theorists because his theory was proved four years later and that's thanks to the space time, the space age, because if we didn't have space missions, it would be hard to prove his point, because you have to get out of this, the, the Earth and go measure this you know, solar wind outside of the Earth. And that's what Mariner 2 did very precisely on its way to Venus and made it very clear that that's the solar wind. So that's in the 60s now, right? So in the 60s, he became known for the person who had proposed what really looks like the solar system. And now, you know, many, 60 years later, we know that what his ideas, uh, he not only did the solar wind, but he did the shape of it, which is the, the Parker spiral. He studied how magnetic fields reconnect. So that's the sweet Parker reconnection theory. He has the Parker equation. He talked about shock acceleration. The man just kept on producing amazing things. He jokes that the fact that he, nobody Nobody believed him gave an edge because you know he could go for the next steps following his own ideas without anybody disputing because they weren't believing him. By the time people woke up, he already had 20 ideas. Wow. So he got a little uh, head So he was kind of operating in this like information void. Exactly. And then he could he could kind of kick it into overdrive and just blow past everybody. Exactly. Wow. So that's this uh, amazing man. So, and uh, so, so, you know, that's the beginning. And now it's 60 years later. And, you know, his dream of really measuring things really close to the corona and understanding the temperature of the corona is going to happen. So that's why we're super excited being here at this launch. 
So, so the the name of the probe is named after him. Mm -hmm. But who who are the principal investigators? Like, who are the people that are doing right. the research? So he would be the first person to say, "I just wrote a paper," uh, and you know, it could be wrong. These people, which is led by Johns Hopkins University, the Applied uh, Physics Lab, is where they integrated many instruments made by hundreds of different people in different institutions. So it's a big collaboration. Uh, so the the Parker Solar Probe um, really was you know, decades of work by many, many scientists. Nikki Fox uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins is the project scientist, and she is sort of leading the, the whole uh, end of integration and the whole project. But there is many, many people involved, and so Parker would be the first one to say, you know, my part was easy. These guys are really the heroes. They are making this whole thing uh, be put together and so well designed, because getting close to the sun is no piece of cake, right? So the sun is very hot, the corona is even hotter, um, and you need to, for all the equipment to not only operate but communicate to Earth. Wait, wait a second. Did you say the corona of the it's sun is hotter. hotter than the sun? Yes, it's something. And I'm supposed to know that. I just didn't no, know that. Yeah, that's pretty. Uh, nobody understands it super well, but let me explain it um, the way I would try at home. Okay, see if it works. So temperature is one parameter, right? So if you are with some temperature in Arizona and some temperature here in Florida, it feels different. Well, you because have radiation of humidity, and convection and all these different You things. have humidity, right? Okay. That's one other parameter. So the temperature is one parameter for describing a gas. But there's also, for example, humidity, which we are used to because we know we're sweating a lot more here than we do in Tucson. However, um, in the sun, so the difference between the, the surface of the sun and the corona of the sun, the temperature is higher in the corona, but the density is much lower, which is why we can get there with this probe. Because if there was the same exact density, meaning if there was as many particles on the corona, with, so the, the very few, so if you think of it as a bunch of particles, so the particles on the surface of the sun, they are hitting each other, so they don't get to be very high speed. They're not, you know, with the velocities at very high, which means that their temperature is a bit lower. While the ones which are ejected at the corona, they are going very, very fast. And the mechanism that makes these particles that were on the surface of the sun to be kicked out with bullets is the one that they're trying to understand. And this, this has to do with the magnetic fields of the sun. So it's a very complex magnetohydrodynamic problem. And so these measurements are going to be the ones trying to explain exactly how this mechanism works. We have many theories, uh, which are sort of details on top of the solar wind, but the basic idea was what Parker had suggested, and he also suggested many possibilities, something called nano flares, which would be small flares of, because if you see the sun, you have these flares, right? You have the sun explodes from time to time, and that's one way to eject things at high speeds and therefore make this solar corona higher temperature in the sense that things are moving faster. But the density is much lower, which is why you can get there with a detector as opposed to really hitting the surface of the sun. That would not survive. <laughs> so so how, do you, how do you take an instrument to the sun to make measurements? I'm assuming most of them are magnetic field measurements. You have coils or something along and those plasma. lines. So, so the particles, so you want to measure the magnetic field, the electric field, uh, how they're polarized, how they're changing, and also the densities and the speeds, the energy of all the particles involved. So this wind particles, which are, you know, just but protons and electrons. I, I've always heard that uh, hardening a spacecraft for radiation mm -hmm. or, or... It's really hard. It's very difficult. And, yes. But So you have the challenge of, of having, uh, or the, the spacecraft designers, I should say, mm -hmm. have the challenge of putting antenna on the outside of the, of the spacecraft to communicate with us, exactly. but at the same time, so they have everything hardened with these little ports pointing back here. And the solar panels being sort of retracted, so it's an amazing design. The most impressive technological uh, jump was the, the solar, uh, the, the shield, so that shield is, you know, some carbon uh, composite that was generated just for the solar probe to be able because most of the radiation so the thing about the probe is that it has to be pointed precisely uh, with the shield towards the sun and all the instruments behind 
and that shield makes the instruments behind be at room temperature. So the you know this is you know thousands of degrees on one side and you know normal room temperature on the other side. So these are protected by the shield. If the shield were to fail, the whole thing cooks, right? Or the alignment were to be off. Exactly. So the the avionics, the folks driving this baby is going to be you know pretty well done because otherwise the whole thing melts. So so how do you? So I'm familiar with torque rods. Mm -hmm. You use the magnetic field of you know whatever interplanetary body you're moving up on to actually align the craft, reaction wheels, so what pointing mechanisms will you use? So I'm not the one to answer this question unfortunately okay. because I didn't work on the design but okay. I know that, um, so I'm not sure how, so there are two things they need to do, right, adjust but also know precisely what, so the, the precision of knowing what is the pointing is a really challenging one. So they cannot be off by more than you know, a, a fraction of a degree, because otherwise it's, the pieces in the back cannot be showing. So, but I think you know, the, the precise uh, spacecraft part is what NASA has de uh, developed, and you know, they, they are really the best, so they've found a way to do it. I can, I can see a twinkle in your eye when you're talking about this. Mm -hmm. This is a big day for you, isn't it's it? It's a great day. I mean, 60 years later, what, there aren't people like Jane. I mean, this is a very rare, it's like Galileo or Einstein, you know, these big names. You don't see those folks very often, and they don't get to see 60 years later something, you know, he took his vitamins, right? I mean, he was, he's still with us. Uh, and he jokes that the people who disagree with him are not with us any longer. <laughs> so, oh, that is, that is kind of aggressive. So it's, a great, it's a great opportunity, both the science that we're doing, which is brilliant, but also the fact that you have this history, the story of a person who was, you know, courageous enough to go against the status quo at his time when he was a young man and to be at 91 you know, seeing the, the development of technology and all the effort and the engineers at NASA be able to give him his dream to go very close to the sun and understand how the sun works, which we all care about, right? So, so, so I'm going to ask you a question, mm -hmm. and we're in the NASA PR building, right? Yes. And so the temptation is going to be to give me the answer that you think you should, but so is this an I told you so moment, moment for Mr. Parker? Yes. It is? It okay. Is. It is, definitely. Really? Yes. Okay, but you said he's a humble man. He is, so he will just be, if you ask him, he will say credit to the engineers that make this amazing, uh, beautiful spacecraft be possible, right? He will be basically talking about everybody else, but he's definitely happy that he's right. <laughs> I, think it's o I think it's okay to have confidence mm -hmm. if you've done the work mm -hmm. and, you, and you put the time in to get the answers. I think it's okay to be And confident. he is a believer in science, right? Uh -huh. I think this is science at its best. If you can predict something, get the data and prove that you're right, there's nothing better than that, right? Because yeah. usually most of the brilliant ideas we have as scientists are not correct. Right. <laughs> that's how science progresses, so right? I mean, we throw stuff in the garbage all the time. Oh, that's a brilliant idea. Unfortunately, nature decided not to go that way, right? But, you know, his brilliant idea is exactly how nature behaves. And he had that insight. He had the intuition. And there's still many questions, which is why science, we keep moving, but we never get to, you know, solve everything. Uh, but the precision of the questions today are sort of, you know, icing on the, the cake, right? The cake he really built himself, and 60 years later, he, it's still standing beautiful. It I, works very well. I can also tell two things about you. Mm -hmm. You're hyper smart, and you're also <laughs> hyper selfless, because you haven't said a thing about what you do this whole time. You've been talking about other people what do you what do you so research? So what I do is a little higher energy particles that don't come from the sun, but they come from black holes in other galaxies. So much bigger energy than what we are looking into in the sun. So if you think of very very large black holes and their jets, these amazing objects, they can accelerate particles with winds just like Parker predicted for the sun, but with much higher energies, with millions and trillions of energy higher. And I'm trying to understand how that works. And so I'm building my own. Um, you know, hopefully spacecraft in the future, but right now we're doing balloon rides with NASA to measure these particles, including neutrinos, which are very, very ghostly type particles that we just heard about um, the ice cube results in, this, in the South Pole. And what I'm leading is two projects, one, a spacecraft to measure neutrinos in the future. We're doing the design now, and we, we are building the actual prototypes that go on balloons, we launch from New Zealand and we go around for 100 days um, in this, you know, southern 
a part of the ocean to look for these particles. And we see a lot of them, and now we're trying to understand what their origin is. So. And, and what's your equation going to be called? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> that would be, uh, maybe the Olinto neutrinos would be the way to go. Yeah. Not quite the equation, because I think we're, I'm using most equations that people have figured out before. But the I physically neutrinos. saw a twinkle in your eye when you said <laughs> that. I really did. The Olinto neutrinos would be fun. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. I really it appreciate was a pleasure. it. <laughs> okay, I hope you enjoyed that interview. There's two other ones that you can check out here on the channel. Number one is Dr. Tony Case, an astrophysicist at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. It's a, uh, a very in-depth look at the Faraday Cup on the front of the Parker Solar Probe. Very interesting stuff. Go check that out. Other one is with Felipe, who is with the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. I got that right, yeah. Um, he's a deputy lead mechanical engineer or the integrator if you will on the whole probe it's fantastic as well go check those out anyway i'm destin please feel free to subscribe to the second channel here i post all kinds of extra content like this anyway have a good one bye